Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our program at Mechanics Institute Online for Her Hidden Genius, a novel by Marie Benedict in conversation with Celeste Stewart. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events at the Mechanics Institute. If you're new to the Mechanics Institute, we were founded in 1854 and we're one of San Francisco's most vital literary and cultural centers in the heart of the city. We feature our general interest library, an international chess club, ongoing author and literary programs, and of course, our Friday night cinema lit film series. Please see milibrary.org for all of our programs and offerings. And yes, the library is open. So please come down and see us in person. We're very pleased to welcome uh, Marie Benedict. And also, if you're interested in purchasing a book, since we're online right now, you can go to alexanderbook.com and we'll put that in the chat. Also, after our a conversation, we will have a Q&A with you, our audience, so you can also put your questions in the chat a little later on. We're very pleased to be um, celebrating Women's History Month, and what better novel to start with. I'd like to introduce our two guests. Marie Benedict is a lawyer with more than 10 years experience as a litigator at two of the country's premier law firms who found her calling unearthing the hidden history, historical stories of women. Her mission is to excavate from the past the most important complex and fascinating women of history and bring them to light up in present day, where we can finally perceive the breadth of their contributions, as well as the insights they bring to modern day issues. Oh, my dear. And of course, her other novel uh, is The Personal Librarian. Uh, the life of librarian Belle DeCoste Green, uh, J.P. Morgan's personal librarian, which is also a phenomenal book. So just a few words. Um, Marie Benedict's powerful novel shines light on a woman who sacrificed her life to discover the nature of our very DNA, a woman whose world-changing contributions were hidden by the men around her, uh, but who her relentless drive advanced our understanding of humankind and also of science. So I'd like to welcome uh, Celeste Stewart, who's going to be interviewing and having conversation with Marie and welcome Celeste. Thank you, Laura. And um, I'm just gonna gush for a minute, Marie. I can't believe I'm in your presence. Oh gosh. <laughs> your books. I just finished for Hidden Genius. And I also read your, The Personal Librarian, which blew me away. Thank you. Both in our library, um, and I plan to buy all your other books. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, welcome. Thank you so much. It's a delight to be here. If you know me, as it sounds like you do, you know <laughs> how much I love libraries and how indebted I am to them and how they saved us um, throughout all of COVID, I really feel. Oh so my I'm goodness. Very, very grateful. Well, you're like a dream come true. You're, you're so accomplished. Um, and I am honored to be able to speak to you. So let's talk about this book. So the book, for those of you who haven't read it, the book begins in 1947. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is based on the life of Rosalind Franklin. Uh, she's 26 years old in 1947. And she's working in a Paris lab. And she's exhilarated to be there because after working in the London scientific community, the male dominated London scientific community, uh, she is exhilarated to be um, welcomed for her expertise and accepted for her um, direct and sometimes blunt style of communication. I love that description. Uh, so let's, let's begin. So Rosalind Franklin, in my understanding, was an x-ray crystallographer and a chemist. She was. She was. Yes? Yeah. Okay. She, so, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I'm so sorry. Can you explain what exactly she discovered that was so groundbreaking? Yes. Um, 
And I'm going to start by first just describing what x-ray crystallography is. Oh, thank um, you. <laughs> um, I have to say, I, for those of you who aren't familiar with me or my books, I, I write a lot about women scientists because my mission is to excavate women who've left important legacies. And so often those are scientists, you know, that women who've le you know, made this incredible contribution to whom we're beholden, but we don't know about them because, you know, historically women have been marginalized in the sciences. So I'm not a scientist. I love women scientists and their contributions, though I have to kind of teach myself the area that um, my woman is working in um, if she's a scientist before I start writing. And one of the things that, um, I, uh, I do as part of that is kind of immerse myself in their area. And what's, what's really interesting about Rosalind Franklin, um, is that she, she was really just to back up a second, you know, she was born into this very affluent Anglo Jewish family. Um, in the 1920s, her family had been bankers for generations. They'd been in England for a long, long time. Um, education was important. Service was important in her family, but they had no scientists in the family, right? Um, and so mm -hmm. here comes this daughter um, who's brilliant from birth, um, a natural born scientist and mathematician, exceptionally gifted in both areas, really from a very young age and her parents encouraged her. I mean, which is mm -hmm. speaking well of them, especially given the time period that she lived in. Um, I think they, they found it kind of hard to understand her commitment to the sciences in some ways, because it was so outside their realm of understanding, but, but they did support her. And yeah. um, she went to Cambridge, um, Newnham college, which was a college for uh, one of the women's um, colleges within Cambridge. And she eventually did get her doctorate in chemistry, as you mentioned. Now, what's interesting is during this time period, there is this, for the first time, really, science is becoming interdisciplinary. You know, until this time period, science had, you were either a chemist or a biologist, um, or you were a, phys a physicist, right? You couldn't, you couldn't be examining things from a multiplicity of angles. And this is about to change during, um, uh, during Rosalind's lifetime. And in a way, that's how she got into x-ray crystallography. As you mentioned, she had a, a PhD in chemistry. Um, she had become well known for her expertise in studying the micro universe of coal um, during World War II and in the mm -hmm. years immediately after, which had a lot of military applications. And when she went off to France, as you mentioned, she was hired to, um, in this incredible lab experience, as you mentioned, it, it was a place that she really felt like she fit in. She, um, her personality was accepted. She was blunt, which was not always preferable for a woman at the time. Um, and she, the men that she was hired by, Jacques Maring and Marcel Mautier, they were a very experienced, if not expert in this technique of X-ray crystallography which was a new technique at the time. It allowed scientists to look into the micro universe of anything that could be crystallized. And what they would do is they would take this, um, you know, microscopic sample of something that had been crystallized. Um, they would penetrate it with X-ray beams for hundreds of hours in some cases. And then the, the, um, the images that were created from that were captured on a piece of photographic paper. Now to you and I, those, or maybe, maybe some, there's some x-ray crystallographers in the audience. I don't know, but to me anyway, that looked like they would call it scattershot. You know, it was like a bunch of, of little indentations and dots, but sometimes if you were very, very good at what you did would form a pattern that would tell you something. Now, if you took that image and you did all sorts of measurements and all these very complicated calculations, you could answer for the structure of a molecular atom. And that is basically what um, Rosalind Franklin became expert in during her time in France. Now, what she was studying was, um, was carbon at that time. Um, so again, she was learning a technique that as time went on, became applicable to all sorts of substances. And the disciplines, chemistry, biology, all those things are starting to kind of 
come together as was happening during this time. They're trying to unpuzzle some of the big questions of science. In, in that case, it was the micro universe of carbons when she was in France. Gosh, I hope that wasn't too much. I don't know. <laughs> and here I was thinking she discovered the double helix of DNA. Oh, she did. We're not there yet. She had oh, to move to France to do that. I moved to oh England. Oh my gosh. I went to do that. But yes, so if I can move on to that. So what happened was after she left France and moved back to England, she took that skill that she learned, um, the X-ray crystallography skill, which took not only basically genius, but took, it was incredibly laborious. You had to be very meticulous Sounded to like make it. your findings. Um, she was assigned when she moved back to England, she joined King's College, mm -hmm. um, this group called the Biophysics Unit. Um, again, this sort of interdisciplinary unit. And she was hired initially to study protein. But right before she started, uh, Professor Randall, who was the head of the unit, he was well known during that time period for his work with the Manhattan Project. Um, he reassigned her to DNA. And wow. when she started at King's College, um, she was her basic assignment was to utilize her X-ray crystallography skills and apply them to DNA. Now, what's interesting during this, you know. What's interesting about the research for a book like this is that you not only have to learn, at least in my case, uh, DNA, genetics, the, the, the basics of that, because I didn't naturally know that, you have to learn about it from a historical standpoint, and you have to learn what people knew and didn't know at that time. And scientists at the time, they, they knew what they knew of DNA, but they really didn't understand what DNA was, what its role was in genetics, what its structure was, how it worked. Um, and the, but they had the sense that unlocking this might unlock everything. And so when um, Rosalind was assigned DNA and unlocking the structure of DNA, um, everyone knew it was a bigger question than that right? That unlocking that could unlock so much more. And um, she was the only one working on it in England. The um, universities at that time, she was at King's College. There was lots of other labs and universities, of course, but they would have these gentlemen's agreements where they would kind of divvy up who was working on what. Amazing. And there was an agreement between her group and um, uh, the group of uh, one of the sort of similar groups at Cambridge, um, that only King's College would be studying the micro universe of DNA. Um, there were other scientists and other institutions and groups that were studying it other places on the continent or in America, Linus Pauling, the famous scientist, he was looking at it as well. Um, so she'd sort of unwittingly stumbled into this race that was happening, um, but that wasn't how Rosalind operated. Rosalind operated um, by doing the science, you know, kind of hearkening back to her own upbringing. It was incredibly important for her, from her family to do the right thing and to work towards goals that were really for the betterment of mankind, not simply to win the medal, to win the race, um, to make this discovery. I definitely picked that up while reading the book that she did not like that competitiveness mm. She did not. Uh, there was a lot of gray area between, I, I had no idea science was so competitive. I know. A lot of gray area between the little groups that were studying this or that, and they, did, they weren't supposed to stray over into, uh, you know, someone else. I was shocked as I was reading it. So anyway, I, but you, you've already alluded to the fact that you are fascinated by women scientists. And yeah. I you know, assume this is why you chose Rosalind Franklin. So once you chose her, mm -hmm. decided to write about her, I didn't find much in the way of when I went looking. We Mechanics has a book called the Dark, you know, Rosalind Franklin, The Dark Lady of DNA by Bruna Maddox. And that was written what 1969, 70? It was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and she's she had long since died. Uh, there was a play. I kept yes, the photograph 51 was the big photo that she uh, did. 
Mm -hmm. And I finally looked it up and I thought there's a play and it was on the London stage. And of all people, Nicole Kidman. Kidman played her. Isn't that crazy? I had no idea. Had you seen that play? No, I've never seen it. Um, I would love to. It's, I haven't, it's <laughs> With Nicole really Kidman. <laughs> I know. I, I, I mean, I'm not saying it's miscast because she's such a gifted actress. I'm sure she could play anything, mm -hmm. but that is not who I would naturally slot. No, for, me either. For <laughs> Rosalind Franklin, um, who, you know, was considered to be very attractive in her way, but that, that wasn't the focal point for Rosalind, right? Um, yeah, I, I didn't sense was, that all about the work in the science. I mean, she definitely had a life outside science. Um, you know, she was a wonderful friend, had an extended family, um, loved to travel, was a very talented um, hiker. You know, she would hike all these mountain ranges. And, and I definitely have a question about her personal life as, as we get into this Morse, but I don't want to come out with my most curious question right off the top. What I would like to know though, is you alluded to it in the beginning, while we were talking before is how would one even begin to research Rosalind Franklin's life? I mean, there just doesn't seem to be that much there for the layman. So, yeah. and you were writing during COVID. You, I was writing during COVID. How in heaven's name did you do it? <laughs> well, in this case, I was extremely fortunate. Um, you know, as you mentioned, there were a couple biographies and I feel like Rosalind was a little bit known, um, more, more so in the science community. Um, so I would say in, um, what happened to understand the research and how I got a handle on Rosalind, you have to kind of understand the history of, of her legacy and not her legacy so much as, uh, as her, her iconic status within the scientific community. Um, I don't want to give any spoilers, but you know, probably most of you know that Francis Crick and James Watson won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of DNA, right? That, that's what's taught in um, science classes, although Rosalind is now mentioned. Um, Rosalind did not win it. Um, I don't really want to say why, but she didn't get it. And she actually went on to do some really incredible research that's actually super important for COVID um, in the years after she studied DNA. We can talk about that later. But um, after, in the years after uh, James Watson and Francis Crick won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of, DNA, of the structure of DNA, for, um, James Watson wrote a, book, wrote a book called Double Helix, which became like a, a huge oh. bestseller. It was an autobiography of his discovery of DNA, which oh. we'll talk about that shortly, like how little he actually did and how much he actually relied on Rosalind's work and discoveries in order to do that. Not a lot has changed in the work world. No, sorry to say, very sad. Um, and so he wrote this book and in this book, he portrays Rosalind very poorly. She's stereotyped. She's the dark, very difficult um, woman scientist who really could use a little bit of lipstick and a better hairdo, <sighs> literally says that in it. Um, and he, his description of how, and we can talk further about like how, how Watson and Crick actually, they did take her information and use it and did not give her credit for it. That's how they made their discovery in the first place. But in any event, he wrote this book um, and Rosalind's good friend, Ann Sayre, who was the wife of a microbiologist that Rosalind worked with, um, was so incensed by this biography, this, uh, this autobiography by James Watson and how it depicted Rosalind. And also knowing what Ann Sayre knew about what actually happened in the discovery of DNA, she couldn't believe the way it was being portrayed. So she decided she was going to write a biography in sort of like a, to, to break down James Watson's biography, to give a different and in her mind, more accurate account of what actually happened. This was in the seventies. She spent several years researching it pouring through letters, scientific documents, conducting interviews of literally everybody involved, every famous scientist of the period, Watson, Crick, Randall, all sorts of people. And everyone gave her access. Everyone knew Ann Sayre, right? Because they knew her husband. Um, and she recorded all of that. And she became very close with Rosalind's family and gathered 
all this original source material. Oh, that's amazing. Letters, uh, journals, calendars, you name it. Um, that formed the basis for Ann Sayre's really incredible biography of, um, of uh, Rosalind Franklin. And of course, it also contained her own memories because she was <laughs> friends with her too. Yes. That information was uh, given to the American Society for Microbiology's library when Ann died. She, she, get, she gifted it to them. That information in many ways is the best information that's ever been assembled about Rosalind Franklin. And during COVID, they of course were closed like everything else. Um, and I um, connected with one of their librarians. I told you I loved libraries. <laughs> and this librarian copied hundreds and hundreds of pages for me and sent them to me during the mail during COVID so that I could- Unbelievable. I mean, it was such a gift and such a, uh, I mean, I could not have written this book without it. I, it gave me access to Rosalind Franklin, the person. Um, it gave me insights into all the players in the book. You know, I write fiction, of course. So these are my versions of, of people, but it gave me such, uh, such um, structure to work with in creating the storyline and creating the characters in um, fashioning story arcs and motivations and in understanding the science as well. Well, that's a good segue into what I was going to ask you. Sure. As I was reading it, I thought, how much of this is literary license? How mm -hmm. much of this, of this is actual fact or proof? Or mm -hmm. I did, I was shocked to learn that she died so young. She died at age 37 mm -hmm. of cancer. Um, and it was 1958. And mm -hmm. there is a reference in your book to her distaste of wearing the protective gear mm -hmm. they were required to wear while working in the lab. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you had stumbled upon that in your research, uh, mm -hmm. because clearly they're, they think that this is ovarian cancer. That's not a common disease. Right. They have come from you know, what she worked around. Yeah. Um, so the, I'll answer those two questions a little separately. So um, yes, I write historical fiction, but yes, it is very much grounded in the research. The best way I can describe it is to describe the research as the architecture of the story. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the foundation, the pillars, the roof upon which the story hangs. But there is so much we don't know. Um, women's stories, women's histories, women's documentation was really not considered worthy of keeping or telling until very recently. So when you go back to reconstruct a life, very often there isn't the, the rich depth of material that you might like, even in situations like, like this one, where I actually did have a great amount of research material, um, which is pretty uncommon to have. Um, and of course, you, there's always things you're never going to know be, about a person. And so mm -hmm. In many ways, the research is the inspiration for my fictional retelling of a person's life. You know, I almost look at these women, you know, I, I'm honored and inspired um, by the real women. They really are heroic to me, but the cr characters I create are, are really just inspired by the, the, the real life people whose stories underpin them. Um, this, I, the question you asked is a, is a good example of that, about whether or not, um, about how she died and why she died. Rosalind did develop cancer. Um, she did die very young. Um, I did see throughout um, interviews, in letters, in articles, um, in which people who knew Rosalind, who worked with Rosalind, described her disregard of protective gear. Oh. So that is true. Oh. Um, I saw instances where she wouldn't wear a dosimeter, which, um, measured, um, radiation where she wouldn't have any protective gear on her body. And it just, and one of the reasons I explain how x-ray crystallography works is because she was right there moving, um, cameras, adjusting photographic equipment while x-ray beams are going for hundreds of hours. She's oh. right there in the room. Oh, so her, her exposure was, was quite intense. So oh. we don't know, but this is the literary license. We don't know. Um, 
exactly what caused her cancer. Um, I would, if I were to guess, and I'm not a scientist, but I would say it's some sort of epigenetics. You know, she probably had a genetic predisposition and something about the environment triggered it for her. Um, but at the same time, um, it, it is a big part of her story, right? And I yes. had to make the logical extrapolation from the commentary about her practices to the end result. I mean, that's one of those things where all those years as a lawyer, um, working in logic, <laughs> sifting through the facts, sifting through the cases and creating a hopefully a strong narrative on behalf of a client really played to the stories that I was creating here. Gotta so, love those lawyer writers. Oh, there's too many of us. <laughs> well, too many then that, lawyers probably. And the so world. then that brings me to my next question. While doing your research, there is a significant portion of her hidden genius that pretty much establishes that her mentor, John mm -hmm. Maring, mm -hmm. on true love. Um, yeah. It overshadows all the other men mm -hmm. in the book. Um, was it true? That's a, that's poetic license, literary license. Oh. Again, we, we do know that she made a lot of comments to people. Um, okay. who she was close to about him. Adrian Weil, um, who was her mentor, um, a French woman refugee who came and taught at Cambridge during World War II and then introduced her actually to Jacques Maring and, and um, Marcel Mathieu. Um, there were comments made by people, Frank Luzetti, who worked in new, uh, both of them worked in the lab about something that transpired. There was certainly an attraction. Ooh. He was a very, um, he was popular with the ladies. Let's just put it that way, even though he was married. Uh, he was married. He was married. And so there, there was definitely something there between them. Do we know exactly what it is? No, we don't have the letters um, between them. Certainly she did not leave any behind. Ah. And it's my understanding that he destroyed all her letters to him. Um, he did come and see her at the hospital right before she died. And that's in the book, I believe. Yeah. And that's true. He did come. I mean, they stayed in contact in probably better contact than I describe in the book, um, because I did want to have that separation for her. Mm -hmm. So how far their relationship went, whether it was mostly in letters and in whispers, whether it was just dreamy on her part, whether it was something that was completely fulfilled, we really don't know. And so that was where I kind of had to extrapolate from what I did know mm -hmm. and, and sort of fashion based on my understanding of the characters that I've created. Certainly he played a large role in those years. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't help but think he played a role in her decision to leave the French lab where she was so happy. Yeah. Um, socially, professionally, she was accepted and celebrated and she was doing incredible work. Um, because I, I really did feel like it had to be something other than just the fact that her family was in France. I mean, in England that caused her to leave because she really felt at home in France in a way she that she did. never did in England. She never quite fit in there. So, so that brings me then to after she left. Yes. To work among these three men, mm -hmm. James Watson and Francis Crick and there, there was definitely so much in your book alluding to the fact that they actually stole her mm -hmm. because you mentioned the lab was, uh, you know, unlocked, that she thought they were in the lab. Mm -hmm. um, she was always looking over her shoulder at these mm -hmm. men and they were not very respectful of her. Mm -hmm. Is there any proof that they actually? Um, well, Yes and no. So what, here's what, here's what we do know. We do know, you know, she worked, um, uh, Morris Wilkins, mm -hmm. one of her coworkers, he had been working on DNA prior to the head of their lab, giving it to Rosalind. Um, he hadn't been making, uh, Morris Wilkins hadn't been making much headway. His animosity over that never ceased. And, um, his dislike and actual probable hatred 
of Rosalind because that had been taken away from him and given to her was legion. Um, we do know, you know, Watson and Crick worked at Cambridge and we know that he would go and complain about her to them incessantly. Now at Cambridge, they weren't supposed to work on DNA, right? Right. They, they were going rogue. <laughs> they were going rogue. They were breaking the rules that had uh -huh. been made and the contract were unspoken. Um, and they were making different stabs at it. You know, we knew that they were uh, almost like obsessed with DNA and that Morris Wilkins was feeding them information about ro what Rosalind was doing, right? Because as a, as a coworker, he would have a general sense of what she was doing. Um, we know all that to be the case. We okay. also do know that as she progressed in her findings, um, she created the famous photograph 51, which is considered one of the most important images in science, which de really definitively established it's a crisscross, which is um, right. of, a, of a double helix um, that that really unlocked the structure of DNA. Now, Rosalind being Rosalind, Rosalind being an excellent scientist, wanted to do all the calculations to support that, right? She wasn't going to just make a flip determination and not, and not back that up and that took time um it, it's they didn't have computers i mean th these were no. calculations no and um morris was getting frustrated right that came across in the book and eventually um he basically filled them in on what was happening and at a certain point he did show photograph 51 to james watson we know that because James Watson said it was true. Okay. So we I know see. he wrote about it in his autobiography. We know that um, without her knowledge or permission, her images and her data was shared with him. So it's for real that they did. I'm also one last question, and I'm very curious about it. Um, there were when those three men approached her, they were very disrespectful and they called her by that nickname that she did not like. Rosie, yeah. They called her Rosie in this over, overly familiar way. Yeah. Is that documented? Did she really? Oh, for sure they did that. that nickname. Yeah, she hated it. And because she hated it, they used it. Ah, okay. And her two face. And then in James Watson's Double Helix book, he calls her Rosie. Actually, that was one of the things that enraged Anne Sayre, her friend, so much. She's like, if you knew Rosalind Franklin, you knew that she hated that nickname. She refused to be called it. She corrected people when they called it. So either he didn't know her and is making all this up, or he's he is disrespectful of her and he was baiting her. Well, I definitely think that you you brought that across in the book beautifully. <laughs> because as I heard him calling that and as I, I read his dialogue I remember thinking oh oh not a lot has changed in the work world mm -mm. That's so sad. yeah and he they beat her to the punch um what I'm wondering is for our uh, viewers yeah you have a certain passage picked out in your book that you might want to read oh I didn't know I was gonna read well no I just wondered if you I'm yeah. sorry, I don't. No worries, no worries. I apologize. Um, I actually don't usually read because, um, you know, my books are audio books. And um, my, uh, the actress. I listened. Oh, did you? Yeah, to her they did genius. such a masterful job. Oh, it was I, beautiful. They bring these characters alive. And honestly, I, after listening to my books read by people like that, I just. Well, they use professional actresses. Yeah. Yeah, they're very it, talented. Nicola um, Bar Nicola Barber. Barber, yes, read it. I love her. She's done several of my books. Wonderful. Yeah, I, I just love her. And so when I'm given the option, usually, you know, I get to ultimately have to say my uh, producers will, will pull together several actors. I and, didn't know that. Yeah, they really? take a passage and they'll have maybe anywhere from four to six. They'll narrow it down and then you get to listen to them as they would be reading your book and then you get to choose which one you want and i always ask for nicola if she's available to to join in the process just to see and i inevitably pick her because i just think she really oh she doesn't sound the same in each one but she's just so talented it was the, superb oh really so truly so you know why i don't like to read my own books oh. so 
<laughs> after you listen to Nicola. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the audiobook industry has really evolved. It, it's amazing. It really, I have to say, I was never um, originally a convert to that, but now that I am, oh. I, you know, I read books, regular books too, but I have that going all the time. It's like, like a stage production. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. They do it in a studio. It's yeah. It's amazing. I think you could probably carry it off. Um, oh, heck no. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Michelle Obama That's... reads her own. She re she She's reads Michelle own. Obama. <laughs> I mean, no one could do Michelle Obama, but Michelle Obama, I think. True, true. Um, before we open up to some questions, I, I just wanted to also ask uh, Marie about through the research, were there other women, other colleagues that sort of surfaced as well that um, Rosalind worked with that became uh, also uh, pioneers in this field or in related fields that you found through the research. Oh you know, my at, gosh, absolutely. Uh, at the college, King's College. I mean, it, I have to say, um, reading through the people that she worked with, men and women, there are so many Nobel Prize winners. It's crazy. right. Um, one of her colleagues was Dorothy Hodgkins, who, who won a Nobel Prize. One of her very close colleagues, she, after she... Um, finished at King's College um, and did her DNA work. She actually did an incredible, um, super important work in RNA and viruses. And I do just want to point out before I mention this other thing, that that work, and th this was one of those unique instances in which the legacy of the woman I was writing about expanded before my very eyes as I was writing her story. The work that Rosalind Franklin did with RNA and viruses is foundational to our understanding of COVID and to the yeah. creation of the vaccines. I don't know where we would be without that particular work. And that work that she started at Birkbeck College after she left King's College, she um, hired uh, a wonderful scientist to collaborate with her. And I was so happy towards the end of her life that she had this wonderful relationship after having these terrible experiences at King's College. That man was Aaron Klug. Um, he continued on with the work that he and Rosalind started, and he won the Nobel Prize for that work. Um, scientists often say that if Rosalind Franklin had been given credit for her DNA work, and if she had lived to complete the work that she started with Aaron Klug, she would have won not one, but two Nobel, Nobel Prizes. Prizes. So, I mean, the, the people that she was working with and the work that she herself was doing was absolutely groundbreaking and world-changing. Amazing. Amazing. She, she was an amazing person. They do not award Nobel Prizes, though, posthumously. Right? And that has been the excuse all along, but yes, ah. the problem. Yes. Okay. Um, when they won, when Watson and Crick and Morris Wilkins, who never deserved it, um, won the Nobel Prize for the, the double helix discovery of um, structure of DNA, she had passed away. But what's really interesting is that, um, you know, the way I had to learn about how the process worked to really understand that. And the scientists, you know, make nominations. And then there's an independent Nobel Prize investigation committee that investigates the nomination. And then they do their own research. And oh. in, the, in the report that that committee, um, investigation committee conduct, made, it says explicitly that they didn't understand why Morris Wilkins was awarded the Nobel Prize, that Rosalind Franklin, had she been alive, it should have been her. So there was, you know, from an independent assessment perspective, there was an acknowledgement that, that she's the one who did, who made the critical, uh, who, you can't build a model without data, Right. She kept saying that. Watson and Crick built a model, mm -hmm. they wrote a paper based on the model. They jumped the gun. They couldn't have ever built that model without her data. She was the only one doing the research. Interesting. What an interesting junction of serendipity for you, considering mm -hmm. all that she did. Um, it's very timely because of COVID. <laughs> yeah. And probably all that research happened because of COVID, because that librarian was probably working remotely right. and had the time to be able to do all that. That's probably and true. What an yeah. amazing, amazing accomplishment. Thank you so much. Marie. Thank you. I so appreciate it. <laughs> and if you have any 
from the audience uh, at the moment. If and if not, I will also ask a couple questions about uh, the personal librarian. Any any questions out there yet? Okay. Well, while no. you're putting your questions in there, um, I will. I'll just go ahead with a couple of. Yeah, it, it is pretty amazing to think that the vaccines that we're getting mm -hmm. for COVID have this foundation and RNA, and of course, um, uh, Doudna and her uh, partner in France, who also received, didn't they receive the Nobel Prize for the, their their RNA, uh, the vaccination with CRISPR? So That's right. It's, it's, it's an, also based on this foundational work. It's, it's an incredible scientific right. legacy, and it's it's just it's just exhilarating to to get this history unveiled and uh, also revealed uh, and brought to the surface. And uh, so thank, thank you for all your great research and writing. And uh, it, it's really exhilarating. So your other book is also groundbreaking because it, it is this incredible portrayal of uh, Belle uh, DeCoste Green, mm -hmm. uh, who was JP Morgan's uh, personal librarian and also right. built up the whole JP Morgan library that I, I was I was just saying to Marie that I was also at the library uh, the JP Morgan library in New York uh, just this summer and it's if you if you go to visit that library you know what an accomplishment that was um, I wanted to find out more about how you came upon this story and also your collaboration with co-writer Victoria Christopher Murray, who is also a very accomplished writer as well. And how, you know, she's she's an MBA and you're a lawyer and you're these two, you two of you, you must have just- High powered. <laughs> yeah, firepower together. So um, a little bit of more, of more about um, your history and in, in, in finding and in finding Belle and how it sent you off in this in this direction. Sure. So, um, you, I mean, you summed up the story of Belle so well, you know, she was JP's personal librarian. She was really instrumental in building up, um, gosh, one of the world's best collections of rare and priceless manuscripts. Um, and, you know, what's astonishing is not just the collection itself, but the library. I mean, it's lined in Renaissance masterpieces. It's, I mean, it's one of the most stunning jewel box libraries I've ever been in. It's really gorgeous. Um, so I found Belle, or I, I didn't find her, I just, but I learned about her for the first time um, when I was a lawyer. I think you mentioned earlier, I think somebody did that I was a lawyer for a long time. I was a commercial litigator in New York City for over a decade. Um, I, I knew it wasn't what I was meant to be doing with my life. I had always loved history. I had always been fascinated with the unknown pieces of history, particular women's stories. Um, and while I was practicing, I worked crazy, crazy long hours. And um, I would kind of duck out in the afternoon, which is really like five or six, because I worked like 18 hour days. And I would go to the different cultural institutions in New York City um, and kind of try to envision a different life for myself. And one of the places I like to go was the Morgan Library. Um, as I mentioned, you step in there and you feel like you're transported into a different time and place. And that was what I needed at that time. And um, I was very fortunate. One of my times that I visited there, a docent who I think probably had just finished a tour and I just started talking to her about something I was looking at. And she mentioned that um, JP Morgan didn't create the collection alone, that there had been a woman who was um, instrumental in, in creating it with him, um, his personal library and her name was Belle Costa Green. And at that particular time, there really was no mention of Belle in the library, um, or at least I wasn't aware of it. Now there's a couple things. There's a, um, a statue of her, there's some plaques, um, there's explanations about her role. At that time, there really wasn't. And so I, I, I was collecting information, to, uh, thinking about what I wanted to do next. And I sort of collected that information about Belle. And as time went on and I transitioned from um, being a lawyer to writing and, and focusing exclusively on these women's stories, her name was always on that long, long list I keep about important women that I wanted to write about. 
Um, but as the years went on, her identity, her actual identity became known. Um, it, it became known that Belle was um, a black woman passing as white um, during a time period of segregation all throughout our country. Um, the Jim Crow laws were so strong, practices were so strong, she would have not even been allowed in the library that she ran at that time. And it was more than that. It was that her, she came from this unbelievably rich heritage of, um, of black people. She, her father was the first black graduate of Harvard and he became a very well-known advocate for equality during his lifetime. He was the first black professor at University of South Carolina. He was a lawyer, a famous orator. And her mother was, came from this really rich tradition um, in Washington, DC, there was um, a multi-generational free community of color that had um, been established there for a long time. And that's where her mother was from. Her, they were affluent and educated musicians and doctors and engineers. And, and this was this woman's culture and heritage. And yet, because the society that they lived in was segregated and, and prejudiced, um, she could not be her authentic self. And when I learned that about Belle, I thought a woman that I had already knew was remarkable, she became even more remarkable still. And, um, but something else happened too. I realized that once I sort of get a handle on what her true identity was, that that was not a story that I could write myself. Um, I can imagine a lot of things as a writer of fiction. I mean, I just imagined, you know, being a scientist, which is definitely outside my, my pay grade. Um, but I cannot imagine what it would be like to be a black woman in this country then or now. And I knew it, that Belle deserved to have her story told by a black woman too. And so at that time, I happened to be reading one of my co-writer and now one of my dearest friends in the world, Victoria Christopher Murray. Um, she's a wonderful book called Stand Your Ground, which explores the terrible uh, epidemic really in our country of young black men being, um, shot. Uh, she explores that from the perspective of women, the, the mother of the young boy and the wife of the police officer, which is something I hadn't seen done before. And it was really kind of getting at an issue from the, from the, from the perspective of the women, which wasn't again, something that really hadn't, isn't normally done. And um, I just thought, wow, I, I really liked what she was trying to do. She was trying to approach it from a variety of angles, um, both from gender perspectives and racial perspectives. And I just thought, I wonder if she'd be interested in, in exploring Belle Costa Green with me. And so through our agents, I reached out and fortunately she was, she was, she was a contemporary writer, but um, she was willing to take a dive into the world of history and she probably will never turn back. I have to say <laughs> she loves it so much, but it was really, um, writing that book was such a gift, not just to bring Belle's story out into the world where it really does deserve to, uh, to be, she deserves to be celebrated and she's going to be at the morgue and things are, um, very much changing there, but, um, she also, uh, it was also just a gift to write that book with Victoria. So that's a great that's book. Elder Costa Green and, and how I found her. And um, yeah, it's, it's a, a really amazing, not because I wrote it, but she's just an amazing person. Really incredible. I mean, and he, he would not know, right? He, JP Morgan did not know. We don't think he did. Um, you know, we don't really know for sure. Again, this uh, is a okay. literary license. Um, certainly when he interviewed her for the position he would not have known. Um, Belle at that time, I mean, it's very complicated along the story of how she went from living as a proud black woman to, be, to living, to passing, living the life um, uh, as a white woman. But um, she was fairly fair skinned, but mm -hmm. not as fair skinned as some of her siblings. And um, that's why her mother, her father's name was Richard T. Greener. Um, when they decided, when she, her mother and her siblings decided to live as white, they changed their name to green because the one thing that could not happen is they could not be linked to Richard T. Greener because he was a, a fairly famous black man during his okay. lifetime. And that would have, 
definitely not allowed them to pass. Um, but for Belle in particular, her mother added the name DaCosta um, as a way of explaining away any oh, questions yes, heritage, heritage right. with Portuguese. So when she, um, the way that she interviewed for this job um, with JP Morgan, she was a librarian at Princeton University. Um, she did a lot of things, but she has, was starting to develop a specialty in rare and priceless books, in particular, early printed word. Um, and that was something that Junius Morgan, who was JP Morgan's nephew and had donated books of that type to the Princeton University Library. He spent a lot of time there. They became friends. Um, and that was an area that Bell was fascinated with and was developing a certain amount of expertise. He recommended her to J.P. Morgan as a potential candidate for his personal librarian. Now, I mean, he was interviewing, uh, everyone else was a man. Um, for the most part, they were senior curators at places like the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, and in comes Belle, this beautiful, petite um, woman. And um, I, we, uh, Victoria and I do not think that he would have, have, suspected that she was black, not only because of the way she looked, but because Junius met her at Princeton. At Princeton, wow. Princeton was one of the most segregated um, of the Ivy Leagues. It was the last to have black students. It very much operated like a Southern institution. They would have never hired a black librarian. So when she went to interview for that role, he would have had no reason to think that she was black. And if over the years, when people speculated, which they did, um, you can read it in, in all the profiles of her, the wow. dusty complected Belle de Costa Green, the exotic Belle de Costa Green, they always used phrases like that. Um, you know, when they did that, um, he, you know, it's possible that he heard gossip or rumor, but by that point, um, they were so close mm -hmm. and he was so dependent on her that even if he had suspicions, uh, we think that he would have pushed them aside. Let's hope so. Yeah. And if JP Morgan said you were white, by God, you were white. <laughs> Let me tell you. Yeah. It's, it's an amazing story. And of course, she became so integrated in the society, New York society, the cultural life. I, you know, I, I've, I've just started reading the book, but you know, now I've just found out today that she was also had a relationship with uh, Bernard Berenson, the great art critic, but also, and I'd love to you to talk a little bit about that, but I also want to know more about, you know, because of the timeline of her experience with in New York and JP Morgan, and, and I wanted to know more about whether she was a suffragist and if she uh, supported the suffragist movement, she's right in the middle, middle of it, you know, 1919. Well, um, there's some sections in the book where we do talk about that. I mean, I would definitely not say, I would definitely say that she did not um, campaign for that. Um, I think there were points in which in her life when she was kind of poo-pooed that. Um, and then there were other points when I think she changed her thinking on that. Um, and and she, she definitely had friends and connections in every facet of Gilded Age and society. I mean, she was, uh, she would hobnob with the Vanderbilt's weekend in Newport. Um, she was taught to drive by Rockefeller. I mean, these were the people that she regularly went to the opera with and dinner. And yet she had all these bohemian friends too. And she had friends that were suffragettes. So I wouldn't say that that was one of her focus areas. Um, she tended to shy away from anything political and Victoria and I kind of feel like that might be because she was trying to distance herself from her father. She didn't want to run into people or um, or make connections with people who might have anything to do with her father. She had to be really, really careful of that. And there was certainly a chance in those circles that that might happen. Great. And um, do you want to also talk about Berenson at all? A little bit about Berenson. So um, she met uh, Bernard Berenson, as you mentioned, he was really the preeminent art critic of the Renaissance um, during the Gilded Age. 
in many ways, I would say that he brought the Renaissance back to life. Um, in some ways, he made it uh, very popular with um, the, the people of that time period. He explained it to them, explained the, the iconography, the the backdrop, the the characteristics of the artists. He really put it all together and and sort of reinvigorated it during that time period. Um, and he, you know, I wouldn't say it was famous, but he was famous in those circles. And Belle de Costa Green actually knew him from childhood, not personally. She knew him from his books. He had several books, which basically were um, critical art history texts in various aspects of Renaissance artwork. And her father, who was, um, as I mentioned, a lawyer and an orator, he was the, um, the first black librarian of the University of South Carolina, and he was very interested in, in art as well. And either he or one of her aunts gave her one of Bernard Berenson's books when she was still a child. Um, but that was an area of interest for her. Um, they met, that, that was where the circles that he traveled in, um, the, the world of JP Morgan and all those high level art collectors. And they met um, most likely at the Morgan Library. Um, the Bernard, the Berenson's, Bernard Berenson was the art consultant for um, Isabella Stewart. Uh, Isabella Stewart Gardner. They were, uh, Isabella Stewart Gardner and JP Morgan were kind of like competitors in terms of who had the best collections. Um, and so there was a lot of kind of, you know, looking over your shoulder, seeing who's got what, who has what, and they, they met. And they um, started a torrid love affair um, yeah. with, his, with his wife's knowledge and permission. Um, they had an open marriage and um, that went on for many, many years. And in the years after that part of their relationship was over, they still, they still um, even though we don't talk about this in the book because we don't go into that time period, but um, they maintained a long-term uh, professional relationship. Mm -hmm. And so the letters, when Belle died, um, right before she died, she burned all of her correspondence and she instructed everyone she knew to burn anything that she had written to them. She did not want to risk that anyone would put anything together about her real identity. And, um, she and Bernard were still in contact at that time. And the kinds of letters that she wrote to Bernard were almost like, like diary entries. She would start one at the beginning of the week and each day she kind of write more and then she would send them to him. Yeah. And that went on until she died. And he is the only person who did not burn her letters. He kept them in a trunk at Itati, which is his uh, villa. There was his villa in, um, in France, uh, not France, in Italy. When he died, he donated that to Harvard. Um, it, be, it became like Harvard's Italian outpost. And so if you wanted to see Belle de Costa Green's letters, you had to go to Itati, which is where I was supposed to go during COVID, which, and of course it was closed. But I will say this, fortunately, one of, uh, there's only one biographer of her. Um, she did uh, copy some of those. And so we had access in that way. But I will say as part of our book, and as part of the Morgan Library subsequent embracing of the Oh dear, um, Marie? Okay, you're she, back. We lost yeah. you for a moment. I'm sorry? We lost you for a moment. Oh, you, I'm sorry, sorry about that. Can you repeat what you said just now? I'm sorry. Oh, sure. As part of uh, the Morgan Library in 2024 is going to have a, a huge hundred year celebration. They became Ooh. public in 1924, which Belda Costa Green is largely responsible for. Oh. And, uh, and again, uh, Marie, we lost you, I'm afraid. Um, I'm sorry, can you see me now? We, well, we can see you, but you froze. It's yeah. like maybe there was something in the universe that doesn't want you to say what you're trying to say. <laughs> give, give us the date of the, this anniversary again. I, I, it'll be in 2024. Mm -hmm. She will be the focal point of the celebration. And they have digitized all the letters between Bernard and Bell. So people can, that's the best source material for us to discover the real Belle de Costa Green. He did not know she was black, but he knew pretty much everything else about her. It sounds like it should be a movie. <laughs> it is, we have sold the rights. 
to oh, um yeah really it's going to be moving mm -hmm. oh who's wow. doing it um al roker and his wife deborah roberts who's the oh, cor correspondent gosh. for Christian america they bought it yeah oh and my gosh congratulations thank you it's very excited we're very excited they're incredible people and wonderful partners for us wow. oh my gosh yeah well, I want to thank Marie Benedict. This has been just a delight to have you with us. And thank you for revealing the hidden stories of these great women. Uh, thank both you of so them, much. A scientist and, a, and a, a, a woman of letters. And I thank you as a woman of letters. And thank you, Celeste Stewart, our library supervisor at Mechanics Institute for a wonderful conversation and interview. And once again, everyone, join us again for our programs. And we will see you soon, whether it's online or in person at Mechanics Institute at 57 Post Street in San Francisco. And thanks, everyone. It's been a great evening. Thank you.